not often that folks who work in seminaries make it into the editorial page of the Washington Post. And yet, that's exactly what happened this week. Uh, to be sure, as we all know, and sadly so, the church has been in the news a lot lately, but not generally lowly seminary workers, and certainly not in the Washington papers. We don't get appointed to anything. We don't run for office. Woodward and Bernstein couldn't care less about us most of the time. You guys can look up who that is. Some of you know. <laughs> but nevertheless, there we were on Thursday in the main editorial page of the Washington Post. And it was written by Father Thomas Berg, a priest at St. John's Seminary in New York, very significant seminary on the East Coast, someone who's been involved in seminary formation for decades. And I just want to read one little passage from his op-ed piece. He said, many of us who have labored in seminary formation for years consider 2018 a watershed moment. In fact, to insist on long overdue adjustments and enhancements to seminary training. In retrospect, many of our institutions have too often failed miserably in preparing men for ministry. And many still fall far short of the goal of forming happy, healthy, holy priests. The church urgently needs new approaches to preparing men for priestly ministry given today's sexualized, secularized culture and the personal challenges facing seminarians. Strong words to be sure, and that coming from a man, as I said, engaged for decades in seminary formation compared to my three years and change as rector here at Mundelein. And yet I hardly think it's a time just to throw up our hands in desperation, and he doesn't suggest that either. But I want to look at some different aspects than what he draws our attention to. Very much forward focused, but also very much grounded in tradition and the present. It's so easy to overlook the present as we perhaps regret certain things from the past or we look ahead, jumping to the future and what can we do to not lose sight of the good and the grace along with the sadness and the struggle and the outrage, but the present is where we live. And for God, the past is not the past and the future is not the future. We encounter God's grace now, every moment and second of our lives. And for us, this is now, in this place, as this group of people at this time. There's a line that comes to mind for me. The first time I read it, I thought, wow, what a, what a hidden gem. I want to hold on to that for a special moment until I realized that it gets quoted in almost every self-help book and management business book that gets published. But that just shows you it's taken a while to get to the seminary world. So maybe many of you have heard it. If you have, just act amazed. But here's how it goes. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men and women to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, if you want to build a ship, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. If you want to build a ship, teach your would-be workers to yearn for the sea. And sooner or later, they'll figure it out. There'll be lots of missteps, to be sure, lots of sinkings and floundering on the rocks, but if they yearn for the sea, they'll learn from those mistakes more than they ever would if you gave them the best teachers and the most perfect textbooks. So what does that mean for us? If you want to form, as Father Berg would say, if you want to form happy, healthy, holy priests, what do you do? And what I'd like to say now as rector, and I think many of my colleagues would echo it, if you want to form a happy, healthy, holy priest, don't give him the best teachers. Don't have him read the best theology. Don't school him in the best pastoral care practices. Don't give him a grounding in basic psychology or counseling. First, first teach him to yearn and all those other things will be all the richer because of it. 
But if the shipbuilder must first yearn for the sea, for whom should the seminarian yearn? Or for what should he yearn? And it is a whom. If you want to form a happy, healthy, holy priest, teach him to yearn for Jesus Christ. And that can sound obvious, maybe even like a throwaway line in a place like this, but you all know it. Those of you who don't spend all of your time in a seminary, you know that yearning for Jesus Christ doesn't necessarily come easily, especially in our society. And it's not only yearning for good, solid knowledge, but it's yearning for encounter. It's yearning for that ability to say, I know this man and he knows me. When that really happens, just like when we truly know a significant other in our life, be it a spouse or a child or a dear, dear friend, then everything else we do falls into place. We want to know about them. We want to spend time with them. We have the guts to let ourselves be challenged by their challenging questions. And we have the guts to challenge them. Do we, as Christians, have the guts to let ourselves be challenged by Christ? Not first by the Ten Commandments or the Beatitudes or this or that rector haranguing you from the podium, but do we have the guts to let our hearts be challenged by the one we yearn for? Easier said than done. But as is often the case, start with Scripture. That's where you begin to see what this stuff looks like. And you see such a beautiful example of it in today's gospel. You gotta remember, we've been working our way through the gospel of Mark. And so just before we get to today's passage, Jesus has yet again told the disciples, let me tell you what it means to know me. If you want to know me, you have to go with me all the way to the cross. If you want to know me, you have to be willing to sacrifice not because God the Father is some sort of sadistic God, but because it's only in sacrificial love that we really open our hearts up to give and receive love. The parents here with babies in their arms, the parents here with children who've grown and moved on years ago, the sons and the daughters and the seminarians, we all know this at some level in our hearts. We know what it means to make a sacrifice when the world at large would say, why in the world are you doing that? Take a better route. This doesn't have any obvious advancement potential for you. It'll wear you down. It could tire you out. And why does anyone take on sacrifice willingly? Because it's a beautiful expression of love. That's it. That's what it sounds like. I wish every mass rang out with that sound. And seminarians, I hope you do too. To be reminded of what it's like to give of ourselves when it's difficult or challenging. And most of us are not gonna be called to give our lives in martyrdom, but we will be called to spend our time in self-sacrificial love. And so when we get to today's gospel, basically what Jesus overhears them arguing about is yearning for something other than who he truly is. Yearning for status, yearning for power, yearning for wanting to be able to think good of themselves. And we shouldn't just caricature these guys and say, well, they're egomaniacs, you know, they deserve to be called out by Jesus. Most of us simply want what is good for ourselves and it's not a selfish thing. We want to take care of what we need to take care of. We want some security for the future. And none of those things are bad in and of themselves, but they can be the seeds of very self-focused behavior. And when the chips are down and the invitation to self-sacrificing love comes along, what will prepare us to answer yes to that challenge? It will never happen unless the one we yearn for is the very one who's taught us what that kind of sacrifice looks like. Yes, dying on the cross is an outstanding and dramatic and incredible event, but long before he made it to the cross, he showed us what it looked like to live a self-sacrificial life. And that's how his love was given and that's how his love was received. 
So I just want to leave you not with a line from a self-help book or from the editorial pages of the Washington Post, but I want to leave you with what for me has been the guiding light for every year of my priesthood. And it came from the man who was my rector at this seminary. Some of you know him, some of you know him well. He was then Father, now Monsignor John Canary. Anything I've ever done that you appreciate, I want you to attribute to this one exhortation he gave us. Everything I've ever done that you don't appreciate, I want you to attribute to this one exhortation <laughs> of Father John Canary, because it really has steered my life. And here's what he told us. Always, seminarians, always stay close to the fire. When you're asked, say yes, and when you're called, go. Always stay close to the fire. When you're asked, say yes, and when you're called, go. Now, I wish I could say that throughout my priesthood, I've adhered to that. I can think of plenty of times, plenty of times, many of them in my own family, many more times in my ministry, where I didn't stay close to the fire, where I strayed away, where I was called and I didn't go, when I was asked and I didn't say yes. But every time I dropped the ball in that way, I could hear those words echoing in my heart, not just to beat me down or to make me feel bad, but as an encouragement, as Jesus himself so often does with the disciples. But if we want to yearn for our version of the vast and wide sea, if we want to yearn for the person of Jesus Christ, that's as good an instruction booklet as you'll ever find. What's the fire to stay close to? It is Christ, manifested through prayer, manifested through that invitation for sacrificial love. Every one of us has it in our lives. Who is it for you? What's the cause for you? Every one of us has the ability, when we're called, to get up and go. And we all know people who do that. These babies don't only exist on sunny mornings. They're there at two in the morning when diapers have to be changed. They're there when children are struggling. They're there when parents are near the end of their lifetimes. They're there in the jobs we get up and go to every day. Opportunities to go or not. Opportunities to say yes or say no. And always that invitation is there an opportunity to yearn for the one who will teach us how to actually live this life. And I want to go on public record as saying, because I didn't really have the courage to say that to the seminarians before. This is the first time any of them are hearing me say what I just said. I wasn't quite sure it was the right message for the church today. Maybe it was some antiquated advice better suited to the end of the last century. But now I'm sure more than ever that it's the message for now because it's the message for 2,000 years ago and I'm sure it will be just as fresh 2,000 years from today. And I hope that when we gather next year for this Mass, I'll be able to say things are changing at Mundelein Seminary. Things are changing with a renewed sense of purpose. That courses still taught by a world-class faculty still focusing on all the essentials of the truth of our tradition and faith. They won't be watered down one iota, they'll be strengthened. But they'll be strengthened in a way that help all of us stay even closer to the fire, more willing to say yes when asked, more eager to go when called. That being in the parishes with people won't just be some sort of pastoral window dressing that hopefully we can squeeze into a busy schedule that it will be at the core and center of our lives as seminary. And there won't be any competition between spending time with the people and spending time with the books. I don't recall Jesus ever saying, I want you to be a scholar, don't waste your time with those annoying people. Nor do I recall him ever saying, yeah, blow off those books, once you get your degree, it's all over, now go do something you like. We're on for everything. And that's what it looks like to stay close to the fire and to be inspired with the willingness to say yes and a desire to go.
So if you get a chance, pull down this editorial from the Washington Post, it's out there online. But please, don't be discouraged by words from a man who spent decades in seminary formation. Instead, recognize that these words in their own way are inspired by the same spirit which calls all of us here together today. And for you, whatever your version of it looks like, because this goes for the laymen and women, as well for the seminarians and the priests and sisters in this room. Stay close to the fire. When you're asked, say yes. And when you're called, for the love of God, get up and go.